Chapter 4 of this training program will cover budgeting and managing school district resources. We are in a time of change. The concept of curriculum standards was introduced by the Commissioner of Education, Richard Mills, in the late 1990s. With standards, the responsibility for curriculum content shifted from boards of education and local educators to the state of New York. With the advent of No Child Left Behind, the standards movement shifted to the federal government. So for the last 15 years, boards have funded curriculum and core instruction as directed by parties other than educational leaders in the local district. Boards have been forced to respond to mandated changes. While content requirements are dictated, there had been discretion granted to the local district on how to deliver instructional content. However, the State Education Department recently had developed instructional modules which, while purportedly were to be guidelines for teaching the Common Core Learning Standards, became, for the most part, the instructional models that were followed by teachers in delivering the Common Core content. As a consequence, even staff development activities were driven toward structured frameworks dictated by standards. As a consequence of the above, budgeting for academic programs was to provide sufficient resources to assure compliance with mandated standards. Boards also had to assure compliance with special education requirements. Given this, boards focused their attention in academic areas that expanded program opportunities for their students in non-mandated programs such as art, music, AP courses, college courses, and other electives. Co-curricular activities have also been addressed to meet perceived college expectations for more well-rounded students. Boards also look to enrich educational programs by providing more technology through distance learning, online learning, and through providing a digital device for each child. While these enrichment opportunities were being explored by districts, they also were susceptible to budget cuts as districts felt the pressure of reduced state aid and property tax levy cap. So while they were areas of opportunity, they were also areas vulnerable to reductions, posing a significant dilemma for school boards, especially in less wealthy school districts. We are not finished with the era of academic change. We now have new leadership at the State Education Department and at the Board of Regents. This new leadership has already announced their intentions to once again change the approach to structuring and delivering academic programs and curriculum. We have already learned from the most recent experience with the Common Core that a key to managing change in local districts is an effective staff development program tied to the implementation of change. When we do not have rigorous staff development, implementation is both difficult and probably ineffective, which in turn hurts the instructional process of our children. Therefore, it is essential that as we continue to experience change in the academic environment, boards stay ever vigilant to assure the staff development activities remain focused on enhancing instructional practice and supporting change. 35 years ago, when I was the first elected to the Board of Education in Skodak, the board had a significant amount to do with establishing curriculum and its impact on the budget. At that point in time, uh, school boards were expected to approve curriculum and therefore provide resources to implement that curriculum. I remember uh, probably about 25 years ago, Skodak went through a process to actually establish graduation requirements. We at that time went about uh, uh, being accredited uh, by middle states and we used that as a way of establishing graduation requirements. We set forth expectations for what our students were expected to know at the time of graduation, and it covered a variety of subject areas and, and actual performance requirements for them at the time that they graduated. That then set a set of standards against which the curriculum was to be developed and implemented by our teachers. It was a very profound work piece of work that was done. We called it the Blue Book, and it literally was this publication that we had which had a blue cover. That Blue Book became the Bible for the use uh, throughout the district. All of our faculty members understood it. The board members were very proud of it, even to the point where our community members understood exactly what the Blue Book meant to them because it carefully and clearly articulated the expectations for what their sons and daughters were expected to do and be able to accomplish when they graduated from Maple Hill High School. 
that was very profound, and we used it as the Bible as, a, as we went about establishing our annual budgets. It guided what we spent our money on in terms of teachers and resources to support our teachers in, the, in carrying out their curriculum mandate that was in that budget, uh, in, in that Blue Book um, uh, resource. Then we entered a brand new era when Commissioner Mills came. All of a sudden, we got state standards. And those standards began to articulate explicitly what it is that say, uh, our teachers had to accomplish. And it literally took over um, the expectations for what teachers were supposed to teach. There were, um, uh, I guess, booklets is the best way to describe it, that came out from the state of New York that literally described what the expectations were for teachers. Within a few years, um, most of the courses that were being taught, especially at the high school level, and then it trickled all the way down into the middle schools and the elementary schools, covered exactly what the expectations were for teachers to cover in their classrooms. And that completely replaced the Blue Book. We tried to do an update to the Blue Book, and we called it the Green Book, but the bottom line was by the time the standards had been fully established by the state education department, the blue book, the green book, they were superfluous. They were no longer of any value whatsoever. The state had clearly taken over the whole curriculum development and approval process. And I think you all understand that it went further uh, with the establishment of the federal No Child Left Behind uh, statute. We went and moved to a new era. Now, all of a sudden, the federal government began to start to take over the whole process of establishing standards. And we moved to a brand new era. We moved into the era of the Common Core. And states all across the nation began to establish and adopt the Common Core. And I think you all understand what the fight was that ensued from that. And we had parents and state unions start to rebel against the Common Core. It got linked up with the, the accountability requirements that were imposed on, on teachers. And it began, it began a, a whole uh, source of, of angst on the part of teachers, on the part of parents. There was too much testing. And, and everything became totally disruptive. I think what we ended up with is a... a, a a tremendous confusion about what was going on. N not only was this a, a, a tremendously um, disruptive to the whole educational process, but it really had a tremendous impact on budgeting for, for the academic environment. Over the course of the shift in control of curriculum from local control to state control to federal control, what ended up happening is that the budgeting process around academics shifted from curriculum to staff development, and it stays there right now. I'll be honest with you. I think as a school board member, um, when you start to look at what is really happening in terms of curriculum content, um, what we, we really don't understand what is being taught. What we're, what we're doing is we're playing a numbers game. We're paying, playing a game that has to do with trying to look at the concept of mastery. But if you ask school board members what exactly mastery means, they really don't know. And they can't translate it into what that means in terms of the accomplishment, in terms of what students can do, and how that then translates into what it is is required in terms of their budget. They can tell you, and the superintendent will make it very clear, what the impact is on the staff development requirements. And that means that, that you have to budget for the staff development needs of the faculty in order to be able to accomplish their capacity to be able to deliver on the accountability requirements that fall to them in order to deliver on the student performance improvements that move students towards mastery. That sounds simple, I guess. But from a school board member perspective, what does that really mean? How much money are you going to put into staff development to accomplish mastery? And what is the nature of that equation? You really don't know exactly. You just have to take from the superintendent his guidance based on the recommendations that are coming from the administrative team 
based upon their assessment of what is necessary to accomplish that movement that is, that is required for the school districts um, to move in that direction. I think um, this is one of those things that, that um, has had a very, very profound impact on school boards. I think we bear a, a tremendous responsibility for the education of our students. I think we care deeply about what it is that they're learning. Um, we want to provide the best education possible. We care deeply about their academic programming, and yet we're trusting others to deliver it, and we really have no real uh, measures of how it is that our budgeting process translates into the, the gift of resources that assures that the academic per, uh, at resources we're providing translate specifically to their performance. We must trust that it's going to work. And we have to be responsive and responsible for assuring that we have enough staff development resources in place in order to provide our administrative team what they need to help our faculty accomplish the objectives that are set forth in whatever standards are in place. One of the things that's really confusing is that it's not necessarily going to get any better. Um, we are now in a time when the State Education Department is saying we're going to relinquish back to the schools um, more local control of curriculum. So we've seen this tremendous shift take place um, from real local control to state control to federal control, and now we're looking at moving back to some degree of local control, and we don't really know what that means. Um, I, I find this uh, time very disconcerting. Um, it, it's like we're repeating history, and yet we don't know what that means. Um, I guess it's one of those things, you fashion your seatbelt and you see where you're going to go. And, uh, and, and that's a dilemma for all of us. Hopefully, we'll be able to uh, be guided by our administrative teams and our superintendents and, uh, and be able to, one more time, continue to do what we do as school board members, provide the resources, and continue to push for the best we can for kids. The buildings and grounds owned by the district represent a significant investment by your community. As such, they should be well maintained to preserve their asset value for present and future use, and should serve as a source of pride for the community on behalf of its children and for the community as a quality of life resource. In most districts during the late 1950s and in the 1960s, there was a major expansion of facilities due to the significant increase in students due to the baby boom. These buildings are now aging. In particular, their electrical and plumbing infrastructure is beginning to suffer fatigue and needs replacement. Further, new demands and requirements associated with technology, academic advances in demands, and new approaches to instruction methods requiring different academic environments other than traditional classrooms are creating pressures for major capital projects. As a consequence, we see not only major capital projects to renovate existing buildings, but also major capital projects for new buildings. There have been rumors for the last few years that the state has contemplated reducing the state aid formula for capital projects. This has spurred the local districts to pursue major projects. Major capital projects are a significant district undertaking. It is considered that this topic is considerably beyond the scope of this training material. Discuss training in this area with your superintendent. However, maintenance is something that the board will encounter each year in the budget process. Minor maintenance that can be handled by your own staff will probably be scheduled for summer work. The cost of supplies and materials will be included in the regular budget. More significant projects may require special funding. Sometimes they may be included as a contract item in the regular budget. However, they may be also identified as a quote capital item in the budget. This amount must be separately identified and thus voted upon by the voters. If approved, then the expenditure of funds for these projects are eligible for capital state aid, which is usually at a higher percentage than operating aid. In addition, the funds in a capital budget item can be transferred to a regular budget if needed.
and as such is very much like a reserve fund. Sometimes large maintenance projects, such as a large roof repair or replacement, $500,000 or more, is considered too large to be included in an annual budget. It is not uncommon for a board to provide minimal repair to a roof and defer the large maintenance or repair project until such time that it has two or three large projects that can be combined into one major capital project that can be put out as a single capital initiative subject to a bond authorization. For example, three or four $500,000 projects can be combined to a $2 million capital project, which could then be put up for public vote and then bonded for 15 years. This may result in a much lower annual cost for the district. This practice has been criticized by the Office of the State Comptroller in the past because it does not incur interest costs. However, the inclusion of large capital projects in the annual budget could jeopardize a positive vote on the budget, which may have much more severe implications for the educational program provided to the community's children. As a result, the board may choose to defer these capital projects for inclusion in a larger bonded capital project. It is important that board members remember that maintaining facilities and grounds also includes maintaining and acquiring equipment. It eventually becomes penny-wise and pound-foolish to keep repairing old equipment. In addition, acquisition of new equipment creates the opportunity for much more efficient use of staff time. Remember, staff costs far exceed the useful life annual cost of the equipment itself, especially because newer equipment has most likely a longer useful life than the older equipment originally purchased. But don't forget, even new equipment has to be maintained and storage facilities are essential to protecting and extending the useful life of the asset. Maintenance of buildings and grounds is a very important function of a school board. Probably the most visible asset that your community has, um, other than roads and infrastructure like sewer and water, are the facilities that you built and are responsible for maintaining. They're highly visible. They're large. Um, your the geographic area in terms of acres are significant, and they should be and probably are for you a an image of the quality of what you do and a source of pride for your community um, and I hope for you as a school board member. But they have needs and those needs are just like your home. They are visible needs and there are invisible needs. The visible needs are obviously the exteriors uh, in terms of how the lawns are mowed and things of that nature, whether or not the facade looks good and you, whether or not painting is required. Uh, but there are also invisible needs. Nobody can see what the roof looks like, and they certainly don't know whether or not the boiler needs to be repaired or replaced. And they don't understand whether or not the pipes are 50 years old and need to be replaced in terms of the supply of water. Those are the kinds of things that you need to deal with as a school board member. How will you maintain your facilities and your grounds? Do you have the resources necessary to make that happen? It, and it's very interesting. Um, most people, when it comes to maintaining their house, are very aware of when it is they have to spend money. They know that they've got a 25-year-old roof, and it's time to replace that roof. They know the shingles are wearing out, and they've got to deal with it. But they also think that you spent $20 million on the construction of a building, and they think that roof is going to last forever. Now, they pay taxes every single year, and every single year those taxes go up. And now all of a sudden you come to them and say, I need a million dollars to fix that roof. Well, you're, their, their taxes have been going up for the last 15 years, and, and now you want them to give you a million dollars to go ahead and fix that roof? And they sit there with skepticism, and they say, well, my taxes have been going up for the last 15 years. What have you been doing with my money? Why didn't you fix that roof? And then to add insult to injury, the state controller's office says in a report you should have for years been spending money on maintenance, and you didn't do it. Now, all of a sudden, you've got a crisis, and you need a million dollars to fix that roof. You have not been doing your job. And the bottom line is that you've been protecting the taxpayers, keeping the taxes and the tax increases as low as you possibly could, and therefore you tried to patch the roof as well as you could within the framework of your budget, but there comes a point in time where you have to replace the roof just like the homeowner did. But they don't get it. 
and you have to tell them that this is a natural occurrence. Flat roofs have to be replaced just like shingled roofs. But for some strange reason, they don't equate the two the same, and it's got to do with the tax bill that comes every single year that's presented to them by whoever is sending out that tax bill. Now, how do you deal with maintenance? There's a lot of different ways. A lot of school districts actually have built-in dollars in order to handle ongoing maintenance. It's usually a relatively small amount in proportion to the overall budget, and it really is meant to deal with simple things that have to be dealt with. The simple uh, painting, the simple repairs, your custodial staff probably includes somebody who's a maintenance mechanic that can go through and handle basic maintenance items. So you have some staff resources and you have some dollars to handle the simple things that are normally in place. You may also have a, a uh, capital reserve account that has been in existence for a while that is, is funded so that you can actually go and make general repairs of a larger amount um, and you may actually have a budget line every single year that funds uh, additions to that capital reserve. That's a good thing. Um, and if you're lucky enough to be able to do that, um, uh, feel blessed that you have that kind of capacity. Um, it may also be the case that you don't have a, a large enough amount of money in fund balance. And now, fund balance is a good thing to have. You, if you have fund balance that's tucked away in other kinds of reserves, you sometimes are in a position where you can take those reserves and transfer them to the general fund and then use those monies to handle the, the capital requirements to make a major repair. A boiler goes, and you have to spend a couple hundred thousand dollars to replace that boiler. The thing to do is to transfer funds out of your, uh, out of your reserve accounts into the general fund you go to the state education department and you say, here's my need. You get a project number. You get approval for the project. You go ahead and establish a budget amendment so that you can approve an increase in your budget. You now have a project number, and you can get a capital aid on that, that expenditure and that repair. That's a good thing to do, and, and you use your reserve funds, or your, your fund balance reserve funds, or your reserve funds, or your fund balance in such a way that you basically solve the problem, and you've gotten state on, aid on it because you got a project number and you got capital aid on that particular project. That's a good thing to do. The, if, it, if it is a, a fairly large project and you don't have either fund balance or reserves that you can use to handle that particular issue, then what you can do is you can go ahead and do a borrowing. You can go out and get a revenue anticipation note from your local bank or another institution and then basically use those monies, go through the same process with regard to depositing it, do a, a budget amendment, get the approvals from state ed, get your capital aid, complete the project, um, and then use next year's budget, include in that budget the monies to repay the, the revenue anticipation note and you cover the, the maintenance or capital project that was um, funded by the revenue anticipation note. There, these are the ways that can go about handling that particular situation. But uh, the bottom line is here is that maintenance has to be covered in a way that makes sense. A lot of school districts uh, basically put off major projects until they can bundle them. If they have two or three roofs, they have some major um, academic-driven projects. And what I mean by that is that sometimes you need to rehab your laboratories um, uh, in, your, in your chemistry and, and biology areas. You may have other academic needs. For example, uh, in your uh, arts program, you may need a new kiln in your technical areas. You may want to ba basically establish some new um, for example, a distance learning room. You may have some requirements that are academically driven, and you may want to take and bundle the academic program improvements, the facilities improvements, the major repair improvements, and put them all together in a, into a single capital project of significant size, 5, 10, 15 million. Um, I think you've heard locally that there have been some capital projects that have been 
uh, fairly large in the 100 to 200 million dollar range because they also include expansion because of growth in population those huge projects or bigger projects get put before the voters and then funded through a bond and that bond is normally then um, uh, takes care of funding the overall project um, they do that on and on purpose because it allows for stretching out the payment uh, of the for the cost of that project over a longer period of time that makes sense for one particular reason and usually it has to do with the fact that debt is coming off the books and now you can put debt back on the books think of it this way debt management is one of those things that you want to maintain at a level rate. If debt management, and I'll hypothetically say, is 10% of your bu budget, in other words, debt repayments are 10% of your budget, and you're about to have a major bond issue paid off, that 10% is going to drop off. If you have now major capital projects, including major maintenance projects, that you want to fund, you got three buildings and three roofs that need to be replaced. You can then take that 10% of your budget and issue a new bond and use that 10% to maintain the tax rate and now fund the repayment of a new bond authorization. So school districts that are using a good management technique will look at the expiration of old bonds and figure out whether or not they can take on new debt and have little impact on taxes. And they do this on a relatively uh, routine basis in order to have minimal impact on the taxpayers. And this is a good thing. Um, it involves, and I'll say this right up front, risk management on behalf of the board and the administrative team. Because in essence, what you're doing is betting that the roof will stay uh, in, in good order until you get to the point where the old debt drops off and you can take on new debt. So it's a risk management um, a game that's being played, but on the other hand, it also is a um, fiscal management process that you're undergoing. So maintenance of facilities is very, very important. It's an asset that you have to protect on behalf of the taxpayers. It's highly visible. You have to maintain it in order to keep credibility with the community and to keep your reputation with the community intact. Take it responsibility and use the tools that are available to you. Not only has the tax cap changed the process of budgeting for boards, but it also has a profound impact on voter participation and the outcome of budget votes. Most districts have learned that it is prudent to live within the parameters of the tax cap formula. This is especially true because of the harshness of unsuccessful attempts to override the tax cap and achieve a 60% positive vote to accomplish an override. Only a small percentage of school districts statewide have attempted an override, and within that small percentage, an even smaller percentage have actually been successful. The first consequence of a failure to achieve an override is that the board will probably try to resubmit a budget to voters, either at or below the tax cap amount, or try to once again an override the cap. A second failure means going to a contingent budget, which requires that the district must construct a budget with a tax levy at the amount of the prior year's tax levy usually lower than that which would have been required if the district had used the tax cap formula in the first place. Another consequence of an eventual budget failure is local taxpayers will be ineligible to receive the state tax rebate, which covers the tax increase from year to year in their school tax bill. This is a financial penalty that accrues directly to the taxpayers. In 2016, the governor added a unique dimension to the tax cap override concept. Several school districts throughout New York State had a negative tax cap situation. In this instance, if they proposed an override and it failed, and they went to a contingency, the prior year's tax levy would go into effect and would actually be higher than the proposed negative tax cap under the formula. To prevent schools from using this opportunistic approach, to exceeding the negative tax cap, the governor mandated that even if the district proposed an override in this circumstance, taxpayers would be ineligible for the tax rebate.
Given the tax cap, there is a new reality for boards which result in three scenarios. Because of standards, educational mandates, and costs the board cannot control, such as health insurance, retirement contributions, and utilities, the board must rely upon the administrative team to structure the budget within parameters the board sets. These parameters are usually financially driven by the tax cap and program philosophy, e.g. protect student programs. Non-mandated educational programs, including co-curricular programs such as kindergarten, music, art, high school electives, online and distance learning, and advanced placement courses, become susceptible to reductions in order to stay within the tax cap. Supplies, maintenance of facilities, transportation, and other non-student program-related areas in the budget also become susceptible to budget reductions in order to manage within the tax cap. In summary, prior to the tax cap, Budgets began with the process of administrators identifying program needs and wants. Budget reductions then resulted from discussions with the board based on priorities. The process now has changed in that tax cap sets limits on the estimates of available tax levy revenue. The executive budget proposals from the governor including estimates of tax aid. Together, these, along with local revenues, create a bottom line revenue target, which then defines the aggregate expenditure budget, which in turn dictates the financial framework within which the program budget must take shape. In essence, what had become a top-down budget process has now been transformed into a bottom-up budget process. Given this fundamental change in budgeting, the board needs to be very careful not to micromanage the district or the administrative team. The advice of administrators becomes very important. As a board member, balancing the needs of students with concerns of the community and taxpayer interest becomes an important and difficult task. One of the very interesting consequences of the tax cap is that the number of people voting on school budgets is actually decreased and the number of no votes on a school budget has proportionally and in the aggregate decreased. This appears to suggest that communities are generally satisfied that if the school budget stays within the framework of the tax cap, the public is satisfied and feels that there is no need to aggressively express an opinion on the school budget, either with regard to voting yes or with regard to voting no. It's still important to have an affirmative vote on the budget since a negative vote places the district in a contingent budget position, which is still unfavorable. Further, it is usually the case that an affirmative budget vote signals satisfaction with the school district itself and the work that it is doing on behalf of both the children and the quality of life in the community. It is important that the school attempt to make this last point an important part of the message it conveys to those who are voting in favor of the budget. The biggest change that's taken place in budgeting has been the imposition of the tax cap. It has literally turned budgeting upside down for school districts. It used to be that we built our budgets from the bottom up. We knew what our baseline of expenditures were. We then went through a process of looking at what it is that we wanted to add to the budget. We calculate what we knew, and then we added to what it is that we wanted, and then we'd whittle things down in terms of looking at priorities and end up with a budget that we thought was reasonable then translated that into a tax impact. If it was too high, we whittled a little bit more. But in essence, it was a bottom-up and then a, a priority setting and a whittling process in terms of making sure that we had a fiscally responsible and programmatically responsible budget. The tax cap came in, and all of a sudden, things changed dramatically. We began to look at the budget-making process in an entirely different way. We would wait until we got some sense of what the governor's budget proposed in terms of state aid. That gave us a picture of how much revenue would possibly come in from the state of New York. We then also looked at the tax cap number, and we could actually calculate from the, the tax cap formula what we would get in terms of local tax levy. We also knew that local other revenues were, would remain relatively constant. We'd get some feel for what they were going to be. There was not a lot of change in interest income, for example, or other local incomes. So you kind of knew what the revenue picture was going to be. You could then look at your fixed costs and 
and and project what your fixed cost increases were going to be for things like pensions because the the pension systems would tell you what the increases were that they were projecting you would get a sense of what your health insurance increases were going to be and you knew what your salary uh, contracts were going to be you knew what you, you were going to see in terms of increment cost those things you could actually forecast. You knew energy costs, where they stood. You could build the cost increases, and then you compared the two, and you normally at that point had a heart attack because what you saw was that your, your cost increases were greater than what you saw in terms of state aid increases from the governor's budget and your local tax levy increases under the tax cap. So then you sat there with a big dilemma. Okay, I've got a gap between my projected expenditures and my revenues. My expected expenditures exceed my revenues. What will I do? And I think at that point in time, we all, most of us had a big problem and we began to start to think about what will we do? And and I, I think we all had a basic dilemma and I, and I think uh, my guidance, if I have any to offer, is that... Um, I think you got to be, uh, first of all, um, very, very patient. And what I mean by this is that don't jump to any major conclusions about what it is you have to do. I think there's a lot of exploration that has to be done at that stage of the game. First of all, you got to pay close attention to the political environment. Um, you are not alone. There are 700 school districts across the state of New York, most of which are faced with the exact same dilemma as you, all of which are struggling to figure out what they're going to do, and it's a very, very public environment. Everybody's faced with that dilemma, and by the way, you're not alone. Most municipalities have exactly the same problem. All municipal governments, um, whether you're a library or you're a, um, a, a fire department, or you're at, all municipal governments, towns and counties, um, every, everybody's got the same problem. Everybody's underneath the ta got the tax cap. And so we're all trying to figure out how it is we're going to live with rising costs and a tax cap. And, um, and unfortunately, other municipalities have the ability to override the tax cap by the vote of a board um, of, of whatever uh, jurisdiction governs that particular municipality. You're the only one that is subject to a popular vote. But you also have a political environment, um, and increasingly what's happened um, in New York State is that the, the pressure of the tax cap has been mounting, and, and it's mounting year by year on all local governments. So the, the untoward consequences of the tax cap, especially in an environment where inflation has been so close to zero, and nobody ever expected that to happen, has, has really put tremendous pressure on local governments and especially on school districts. So you got to pay close attention to what is happening in the political environment. Unfortunately, what that means is you really have to wait. You have to wait to see what the legislature is going to do. There are some school districts where state aid is a lesser impact on their overall budget, and they may choose to actually make their budgets well ahead of time. They also may have a cultural history where making the budget um, ahead of time is something that everybody's used to, and they're willing to take the risk associated with not knowing what the state aid's going to be. Um, and, and that is something that they've done historically, and they're, they're okay in terms of doing that. The other thing you need to do in terms of being patient is to trust your administrators. And I say this because the... The task really falls to them, not you, to try and figure out how it is that they're going to manage this, this gap between expenditures and revenues. They will be constantly trying to figure out what it is that they can cut or shift or do whatever is necessary in terms of being able to figure this out. The business official is going to be working hard to try and struggle with where the efficiencies are, what kind of shifts can take place? Are there ways that they can cut back on inventories or other kinds of things to save money? But the administrative team is going to be looking at other ways to save resources and still maintain program. Remember, it's always about kids. They do not want to hurt the education of kids. So they're going to be constantly looking at ways that they can shift resources or manage resources or make 
cuts that do not diminish opportunities for the best education for kids, but also stay within a budget framework that is responsible. So be aware that they are doing a lot of work behind the scenes. The other thing that they're doing is they're trying to do this work without causing turmoil in the district. What I mean by that is they don't want to they don't want to create a lot of scary scenarios for teachers. So they're not going to announce a whole bunch of layoffs or other kinds of things that scare people because if they scare people, it's disruptive to the relationship between teachers and kids. And so the teachers get all upset. That upset feeling ties directly to the kids and behaviors for the kids, which ties directly to kids and parents. Everything gets, I hate to say it, but it gets a little screwy. And you don't want that kind of disruption. So the administrators are doing a lot of work trying to figure out how it is that they would accomplish a very difficult task, but they're doing it very quietly. And that's a good thing because it creates a lot of disruption if it gets to be a very public thing. Now, the other thing is that, that you need to be very clear about the nature of this problem with the public, not to identify how you're going to solve the problem, but to identify what the nature of the problem Here's our budget, our expenditure budget. Here's our projected revenues. Here's the gap. This is the problem we have. Let people know that the governor is proposing this amount of revenue. The tax cap is dictating this amount of local taxes. Here's the budget gap. At this stage of the game, we are exploring every option that we can, but this million dollar gap is a big problem in my 21 million dollar budget that's a five percent six percent problem that we have to figure out how to close let people know exactly what it is that you're trying to struggle with um <clears throat> let me let me just say to you that uh, a lot of districts and and uh, and uh, tried to consider an override um the, the history says that if you try to, to um, take the risk of dealing with an override, you're likely to fail. Um, so then you enter the world of a contingency budget or having to go back to cutting a budget that um, maybe can either go for another override or stay within the tax cap. But the, the history says very few schools actually do go for an override. Those that do are more likely to fail than to succeed. Um, so the bottom line is overrides are not uh, a good bet in terms of time, where to go. Um, one quick note, um, we have now eliminated the gap elimination adjustment, okay? So that's been taken care of on a statewide basis. However, we now have everybody pushing for foundation aid, except for 250 school districts, approximately, foundation aid in its pure form actually imposes a threat. Foundation aid runs on a formula that takes into consideration the population of school districts. If your school district has decreased population, technically under the foundation aid, you should be losing state aid. However, there is a provision that has been in the law for maintenance of effort under foundation aid. If it is not maintained, 250 schools school districts are at risk of losing foundation aid. Now we have a history in New York State of maintenance of effort. And at this stage of the game, most of the schools, the 250 plus schools that are in this situation are betting that it will be main maintenance of effort for the foreseeable future. However, this is something that um, um, we all have to deal with. It's a risk, um, but because there's 250 out of 700 school districts that are in this boat, um, there's a lot of us that have political clout on this one. So I just want you to be aware that while urban schools and many larger schools uh, or schools that are growing are in favor of foundation aid growing, there are a large number of us that are at risk of losing foundation aid unless the maintenance of effort moves forward. One thing to worry about, however, is maintenance of effort means you get the same amount you got last year. It doesn't mean that it's going to grow. Now, that's a problem. So uh, if you need more aid, how are you going to get it? And the question is, I don't know, and we don't know. So 
Again, this is going back to one of those things I said earlier. Be patient and watch the political environment. Precarious time. Tax cap has really changed things. I hope we can figure out how to get something like Massachusetts where the tax cap is 2% and it's not governed by inflation. In other words, you get 2% a year. So let's see. Maybe we can get something like that. We'll see how the political environment may change. The fund balance arises at the end of the fiscal year when there is a surplus of revenue over expense, i.e. not all of the budget as planned is spent. Fund balance will be talked about by your business official as either assigned or unassigned fund balance. Assigned fund balance is surplus money from a prior year which is appropriated in a proposed budget as revenue applied to offset proposed expenditures. If there was money left over that was not being applied as revenue, it is called unassigned. A school district is allowed to keep up to 4% of its budget as unassigned fund balance. For example, if your budget is $10 million, you are allowed to retain an unassigned fund balance of $400,000. The unassigned fund balance is normally held by the district by placing it in several reserve accounts which are permitted by law. Fund balances placed in these reserve accounts are not counted as part of the 4% limit discussed above. Some of these accounts can only be used for specific purposes and can only hold specific amounts, such as a reserve which is used to hold funds estimated to be needed to pay back taxes which must be returned as a result of challenges to tax assessments. But other accounts can be used flexibly to hold money for specific purposes. But if needed, funds can be transferred to the general fund to meet budget requirements. Reserve accounts are not identified as part of the annual budget. When needed, transferred funds are appropriated as revenue in the annual budget. As such, these funds then become known as the appropriated or assigned fund balance. Your school district will have a unique set of reserves and pattern of use of assigned and unassigned fund balance. There will also be a history and philosophy of management of fund balance that exists. You should seek information from the business official and superintendent regarding this matter. Good business officials make sure that they do not prepare a budget that is so tight that has no margin for error. There is always some room in the budget for unanticipated needs. Typically, employees make movements among benefit plans during the fiscal year or changes in special education requirements occur during the school year. Equipment will fail and will need to be replaced. A budget that cannot withstand these types of unforeseen changes is not well designed. But, sometimes fund balance is needed to be used for significant emergency purposes. For example, if a boiler fails, or if several high-need special education students move into the district, in such instances, funds will be transferred to or within the general fund, and a budget amendment will be made to increase the appropriate budget lines in order to respond to the emergency need. Generally, budget amendments are only permitted for limited purposes. Consult the superintendent or business official regarding these unique circumstances. In recent years, because of the tax cap and its effect on limiting tax levy growth as a revenue to the district, most districts have been forced to regularly use fund balance as a revenue source to fund mandated and necessary programmatic needs. Consequently, the board, in concert with the administration, must carefully manage the budget, expenditures, and the fund balance itself over time to assure the long-term fiscal integrity of the district. Spending the fund balance is the equivalent of spending your savings. Once spent, it is gone. It is not a recurring revenue and as such cannot be depended on to fund ongoing requirements. The message, be careful, manage well, and spend carefully. We are in precarious financial times. And uh, as such, um, we have to deal with the tax cap. We have the stresses associated with collective bargaining. We have an unpredictable environment with regard to health insurance and pension costs. And we have a very unpredictable state government. Uh, The state of New York has always thrown more mandates at us and uh, is unpredictable with regard to what they're going to do in terms of state aid. Now, having said all of that, it is very important that you are prudent with regard to the management of fund balance. This is your savings account for emergencies and unforeseen needs. Um, 
it is your business official's responsibility to carefully manage that fund balance on your behalf. It's also your responsibility to make sure that you have a fund balance and you don't spend it in a frivolous manner. Now, what this means, in all honesty, is that you have to make sure that both the business official and you are doing your jobs in order to build and maintain that fund balance. Now, this is a tricky thing to do. Taxpayers are not happy if you overtly and go about the process of taxing them in order to take their money and put it into a savings account. Uh, they're not going to want to have you do that, uh, especially if it's straightforward, a large amount of money. And, and this is one of the things that you have to be very, very careful of, because if they think that you're taxing them and just putting the money not into an educational program but into a savings bank, that they don't think that that's fair. They shouldn't be having you take money out of their pocket so that you can put it into a savings bank. If you want to spend it on education, that's a different issue. But putting it into a savings bank is not one of the things that they think is fair in terms of how it is that you take money out of their pockets. On the other hand, they also understand that it is fiscally responsible for you to have resources in the case of emergencies. So they're not going to be unopposed to the idea of you having some fiscal reserves and funds available in the case of emergencies. So you're, you're walking a tightrope in terms of being able to handle this kind of balancing act. And this is where it's very important that you have a, a business official that understands the importance of building and maintaining a fund balance on your behalf and using that fund balance in a way that is is responsible and making sure that it's maintained both through the use of reserves and through the use of an, uh, 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 the fund balance as part of the budget process. Now, many school districts actually appropriate the fund balance as a revenue. And the key to this is to make sure that you're not spending down your fund balance as a revenue in such large chunks that, in fact, you are eliminating it. When you spend fund balance as a revenue, once spent, it's gone. And at that point, if, it, if you spend a large chunk of it as a revenue, the following year, it's gone. And you don't have that revenue anymore. It's a non-recurring revenue. So the, the issue is, okay, if I have a $20 million budget and I took um, and I needed $2 million to close the gap in, in order to get the revenues I needed to match up to the $20 million in expenses, the following year, if I have now a $20 million level budget and I have only $18 million in revenues and I've spent the $2 million in fund balance, where am I going to get the other $2 million from? And I've got a tax cap that says I can't raise tax levy. What do you do? There's no fund balance to go grab. So it's very important that you do your job and make sure that you maintain a responsible position with regard to how you spend that fund balance. So you need to have a business official that's working in partnership with the, administ the administrators and the superintendent as well as in partnership with the school board in order to make sure that you not just protect the fund balance but on an annual and regular basis may sh be sure that in fact you are if you're spending part of it, you're rebuilding part of it. And that's a very careful and quiet thing that you need to do. It's, it's a management task that you, you share with the business official, and, and it requires careful, quiet, prudent management on everybody's part. So I'll just tell you, um, what I personally do is I literally look right square in the eyes of my business official, and I say to her with, with every earnestness that I have, are you doing what is essential and responsible with regard to management of fund balance? And she looks back at me and she says, yes, I am. And that's, that's absolutely a, a, a conversation we have every single year. I need to make sure that she is paying attention and caring for that fund balance. If she's doing that, then I know that my job as a school board member is to respect what she's done and make sure that I do not violate my responsibility with regard to prudently spending that fund balance. It's, a, it's, a, it's an essential part of the management task of a board of education to protect the fiscal integrity of the district.
The annual budget vote and the election of school board members is set by law to take place on the third Tuesday in May. When most community members think about the school budget, they want to know how much will my taxes be going up. Consequently, they want to know how much their tax rate will change from last year to this year. However, in preparation for the budget vote, the public information made available has no reference to the tax rate. This is a comparison of the amount of taxes to be raised, the tax levy, from the last year to this year. But this is never translated into a specific tax rate impact. As a consequence, a homeowner will never know how the budget and the tax levy will precisely affect their tax bill. Regarding tax rates, for many school districts, it is very difficult to predict the actual tax rates at the time the budget is prepared. The tax levy amount can be determined simply by calculating the tax cap using the statutory formula. Assuming that the district does not wish to pursue an override and does not anticipate a budget that will result in a tax levy less than the tax cap, Although this does occur, the tax levy amount becomes the target, a bottom line number against which budget is formulated. Most school district boundaries cross a number of town boundaries. Each town has its own assessment practices, and within the district boundaries will have different mix of assessed value of properties from town to town. For example, one town may have more commercial property within the district, another town will have more residential property within the district. Annually, the state provides equalization rates for every town to adjust for differences in town assessment practices. This is done so that when tax rolls from different towns are added together, the taxing jurisdictions can reasonably that the properties that are similar in different towns are being taxed fairly. These equalized assessed values for parts of towns are then aggregated for the entire district. This is the equalized full value assessment for the school district. Each town's share of the total assessed value is calculated as a percentage, and that percentage is applied to the total tax levy. For example, if a town's share is 15% of assessed value, it will bear 15% of the tax levy burden. That town's tax levy share is then used to calculate the school tax rate by dividing it into the equalized assessed value determined by the town's assessor. That tax rate is used for the school tax bill. All of this can occur after the assessment rolls are finalized and issued in July for the towns by the county or counties within which the school district lies. The actual tax rates are not set by the district until August. The county then compiles the tax bills for the tax collecting entities, which are then distributed in late August or early September. Given this process, it is virtually impossible for most school districts in New York State to predict in May what the tax rates will be in August. As school board members, we always tell uh, voters that they are voting on a budget and not on a tax rate. On the other hand, they don't understand what that means because what they really care about is the impact that it has on the tax bill. And in this regard, it is terribly confusing to them. Um, the translation of a budget into tax rates is very, very complicated. First off, most school districts in the state of New York have multiple towns that make up the bound are within the boundaries of their of their school districts. Every single town has a different um, tax levy tax rate, and as a consequence, um, your budget gets divvied up into those town tax rates. So there's no uniformity between a tax rate in one town for the school and a tax rate in another town for a school. So depending where you live, uh, there's different tax rates uh, in each individual town. So the comparability of one neighbor to another, depending on where the boundary line lies, uh, is, doesn't exist. The other complicating factor is STAR and, and other kinds of exemptions. So you have STAR, and then you have an enhanced STAR for other folks. And then you have other kinds of exemptions, like for veterans and those that are involved in wartime uh, who are veterans. 
um, and it goes on and on in terms of the other complicating factors. There's a new glitch in, in, the, in the, the law now that uh, for those people that are newly buying houses, they don't get a star exemption in their tax rate. What they're going to get is a star credit on their tax income tax uh, bill um, when they file their income taxes. So that's going to further complicate things. So the bottom line is, is that the, there's such confusion with regard to what's going on with a tax bill that the comparability for people uh, is going to be all over the place. There is no, there is no comparability. So uh, when you try in your budget to give people a sense of what this means for a assessed house at $150,000 or $200,000, the impact of this particular bond issue or this particular budget on that one hundred and fifty dollars or $200,000 assessed house, um, it's, it's highly likely that whatever you're telling them doesn't mean anything anyways because that, that $200,000 house is going to have a different impact from jurisdiction to jurisdiction within your school district. So most, most school districts that have multiple towns really means nothing, um, and it's very, very complicated and complex. And so the bottom line is that the whole thing is very confused. What, what tends to also make it uh, difficult is the fact that the tax cap is nominally 2%. That's what people have in their heads, it's a 2% tax cap. But we know as school board members that it could be as low as zero or it could be a negative number, but generally it's going to be somewhere between one or it could be as high as four or five percent depending on how what kind of exemptions that are, there are in the tax cap formula, like your capital costs. So if you have a lot of capital costs, those things are exempt um, and that could drive the tax cap at not 2%, but as high as 4%. And people are going to look at their tax bill and say, well, wait a minute, there's a 2% tax cap. Why did my tax bill rise 4%? So the bottom line is, is that people are going to say, okay, the budget came in at or below the tax cap, and that sounds good, but my tax bill is a different rate. Did you lie to me? And the answer is no. It is at or below the tax cap. I did not lie to you. Well, then why is this number so different? And the ability for you to explain it is um, nil and no. Uh, I mean, nil and none, I guess. I don't know how you, you go about doing it. And, and, and quite frankly, um, a lot of board members basically say, well, call the business office and see if they can explain it to you. And the truth is, by the way, that they can look up the individual tax on the ta they can look up the tax rolls for that individual homeowner, and they can actually try to explain to them exactly what their tax bill meant. Now, um, so if, if push comes to shove, I would encourage you to try and get your business officer involved and let them explain it to someone who is complaining to you, uh, because you're not going to be able to explain it. Now, there is some good news in all of this, and, and I want to sort of share that with you. And that has to do with the fact that um, the tax cap has had a profound impact on budgets overall in the state of New York. Uh, the rate of passage of school budgets in the state of New York is exceedingly high. It is the highest it has ever been. The percentage of yes votes on school budgets is the highest it has ever been. The percentage of no votes on school budget is the lowest it has ever been. It is also the case that the number of people voting on school budgets is the lowest it has ever been as well. It's, it's a phenomenon that people are not coming out to vote because they don't feel the need to, because we're at or below the tax cap. So it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon that the tax cap itself has given people some degree of assurance that the budget is staying within parameters that they're comfortable with. They like the idea that their school taxes have become what they consider to be in check. And while it's causing us, from a budgeting perspective, a tremendous amount of turmoil and all kinds of problems, from a taxpayer's perspective, they like it. And so they're, they don't feel the need to come out in droves to vote either for or against the budget. And so as long as it stays within a framework that they feel comfortable with under the, under the tax cap, they're, they're not coming out in droves to vote anymore. Um, and, and budgets are passing at very high percentages. 
So uh, it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon. While it's causing us a great deal of trouble, um, voters feel very comfortable that schools are being managed well, notwithstanding the fact that we think they're causing, uh, it's causing great difficulty for us, but schools are being managed well because they're staying within the tax cap. So uh, I guess from their perspective, things are good. From our perspective, it's causing us fits. That's life. I guess we'll have to figure out where it goes from here. For the school district's administrative team, the budget process is year-long. When the budget passes and implementation begins, the implications for next year's budget also begins. The phase-in of budget programs, including the scheduling of purchases, becomes very important in terms of its impact on fund balance as well as the following year's budget. And it's always the case that unanticipated residual impacts and needs surface as a budget is implemented. And these have to be addressed in the next year's budget. It is also very important that administrators bring programmatic issues, which will translate into budget issues, to the board early in the fiscal year. This is essential to allow sufficient time for exploration of these program issues before the intense pressure of final deliberations on the budget. Publishing in the board meeting agenda the topic of these programmatic issues is an important part of letting the community know that they will be discussed. The community should be invited to hear presentations. Public discussion provides opportunities for administrators to answer public questions and address concerns. Information about program initiatives that will have an impact on future budgets should also be publicized in newsletters and on websites. It is very important that the community be aware of developments in school programs that both affect children and will impact the school budget. Too often the community only knows about schools based upon their own experience when they went to school or based upon what they hear from their children which does not necessarily reflect the broad objectives behind a major school program initiative. Most districts use a variety of means to engage the public in activities to inform and solicit opinions about budgets and school programs as the budget is being formulated. Budget committees, forums, meetings with volunteer and service organizations, newsletters, emails, social media, and virtually any other medium that can be thought of is used by districts throughout the budget process to meet this objective. There can never be enough communication with the public on the budget and the programs it supports. Schools are constantly trying to figure out how to keep the community involved in the budget process. And I'm not going to go into the various ways that that's done because it varies from school district to school district, and in m many cases it's just a cultural phenomenon as to how it is that a school district does it. Um, and once processes are established, they're usually built into the culture and they stay in place for years and years. Um, and I think there's a constant struggle to keep it uh, vibrant and alive and to make sure that, in fact, the community is involved in, in in an effective way in the budget process. Uh, and, and there are good reasons why that is being done. Let me sort of set some ground rules for you in terms of why it is that you want to do this uh, in an effective way. The first is that you want transparency. You want to have the public see that what you're doing is an open and clear process, that they can see what, what it is that's going on in terms of how a budget is built, uh, and, and how it is that you're moving forward in terms of making decisions. You want to also show them what the real problems are. You want them to understand your struggle. It's important that they, they get a clear picture of the difficulties that you're having, um, what that environment is like, and, and, and how it is that you're, you're coping with and, and seeing what the problem is. They need to see how you see the problem uh, and understand what that is. They also need to understand the choices that are before you um, and, and literally get a feel for the consequence of those choices. Uh, it's important that they understand that, that this environment that you're in, the, the problems and, and struggle that you're facing um, poses some very clear choices for you and those choices have very significant impacts. They have impacts especially that, that deal with their children. This is something that they need to understand and deal with. 
they should also get a very good feel for the political environment. Um, I think it's, it's one of those things that we now know that the political environment will shape significantly what's going on in terms of state aid and the potential for shifting some of the basic formula requirements under the tax cap. So they need to get a sense of how it is that the political environment could have a significant potential impact on your budget and on uh, themselves as taxpayers and ultimately upon your children and the choices that you're going to have to make. The other thing that you need to get a sense of is what they value. And the only way you're going to do that is to get them engaged in the process. When they see what you consider to be your choices, you need to also get a sense of how they perceive those choices. That'll give you some sense of the values that they hold. You need to understand what their values are so that you can... Um, weigh those as you begin to look at your values and how that impacts on the choices that you're going to make. And, and ultimately, you want to get also a feel of, of the kind of things about what they would do. It's very interesting. Um, they may have uh, some ideas about um, budget choices or budget cuts or budget improvements or efficiency measures that you didn't even think about. It's very interesting. Um, we in education tend to look at things in a particular way. They may be coming out of a private sector environment that has similar circumstances with a whole different approach on how they would solve a problem. There's no reason that you shouldn't learn about those things. And uh, it may turn out to be a very healthy exercise to find out how they might approach a particular problem. I think probably the most important uh, part of this exercise of public engagement is really about building trust. They need to get to the point where they trust you. Ultimately, you're going to have to make the decision. And the more open, the more transparent, the more engaged that they feel uh, you have been with them and they have been with you, the more trust they will have in the decisions you're going to make. Uh, what I have found over the years is that uh, truth be known, they don't want to be in your shoes. They would not want to have to make the decisions that you would make. Uh, you're going to have to make very, very difficult choices when you actually finally decide on that budget. There will be impacts on people they know who work for the district. There will be impacts on programs that their children are involved in. There will be uh, impacts on sports and other kinds of things that they really care about. Uh, there will be impacts on in a variety of different things. And those choices are difficult to make. People don't want to have to make those choices. And so, and it, it is very interesting too, is that those choices will affect their friends and neighbors. They don't want to offend their friends and neighbors because it's their friends and neighbors' kids that may be affected and, your, and theirs that won't be affected. So when you stop and think about it, they don't want to be in your shoes. But they ultimately want to be able to trust that you're making the right decisions. So the engagement of the public, the openness of what you're doing becomes very important in building a trusting relationship. They want to know that you're making the right decisions and, and they know that those are hard decisions and they want to be comfortable that you are doing the best you possibly can because they don't want to have to do that. So... Ultimately, the engagement of the public in the budget process is very important, and, and at the very end of the process, it's all about a trusting relationship between you and the public. So when you engage them, remember, it's all about building trust. It is generally the case that most school districts cannot afford to annually budget for large maintenance projects. Minor projects that can easily be done by existing full-time staff, including custodial staff, during the summer and which do not require large expenditures for supplies, materials, or equipment and can be budgeted out of normal operations and maintenance budget lines. If there is a need for a larger project, it may be necessary to actually budget for a capital project. This requires a specific identification of a capital budget line item, which in turn requires voter approval. Capital funds approved this way can be transferred to other lines in the budget if needed. As such, this is much like assigned appropriated fund balance, but this capital appropriation is eligible for capital state aid reimbursement, which may be at a higher rate than normal operating aid. 
In subsequent budgets, if the board is careful and thinks of the state aid reimbursements for the prior year's capital project as a set aside, it can appropriate the net additional amount as a capital project and thereby eventually create the equivalent of a revolving fund using marginal small amounts of new local funds plus state aid to fund an ongoing pool of resources for capital projects. For example, assume a $100,000 capital project and the 75% state aid rate for capital projects. In year two, the new appropriation of $25,000 and dedication of the $75,000 in state aid provides $100,000 of funding for the second year of a capital project funding. Many school districts put off major maintenance items until they have several, which can be consolidated to justify a major capital project. They then seek voter authorization for major capital projects and finance them through the sale of bonds. This is done in order to spread the cost over a multi-year period of time. Under the tax cap formula, that debt service is exempted from being included under the tax cap, whereas if the capital projects were part of the annual budget, they would have to be paid for within the tax levy dictated by the tax cap amount. Also, a large capital project included in the budget may make the budget susceptible to a negative vote by the public. The planning and implementation of a large capital project is a complex, multi-year activity that merits its own training program and is beyond the scope of this training program. What happens when there is a major facilities-based emergency, such as a heating boiler fails or a major internal water line ruptures and needs to be replaced? Such an emergency may require an increase in the budget. State law permits an increase in the budget to cover these expenditures by action of the board. To finance these expenditures, several options are available. Initially, fund balance can be used to pay for the project. It is also likely that such a need may be eligible for insurance reimbursement. In the event that a fund balance is insufficient to meet the needs associated with the cost of the project, the board can authorize a revenue anticipation note. RAN, to borrow funds to pay for the cost of the emergency. As part of the next year budget, the RAN would be included as a budget item to retire the debt incurred. I want to share some information with you that you may not be aware of, and it has to do with the long-term nature of capital projects. I think we all have an expectation that when we decide we want to build something, that it's going to get built uh, within a relatively short period of time. What we don't recognize is that, um, especially for board members that are uh, planning on having like a two-year or two-term tenure on a board, you may be part of making the decision to uh, engage in a, a, a capital project, and uh, at the end of six years on a board, um, you may not be able to see the finishing of that capital project. Let me just sort of give you an example of, of how it is that a capital project can run. In the first year, you may have to go through an exercise to figure out if you're actually going to do a capital project and whether or not it's viable. Um, and what that really boils down to is you're going to have to do a, a, a and, and I'm, uh, the example I'm going to use has to do with a major capital project to, for example, do a major overhaul of a particular school building or to build a new school building. You're going to have to do a population projection to justify the need for that particular project. Usually what that involves is hiring somebody to actually do that population pro projection. You're going to have to do a demographic analysis. You're going to be, have to look at the community, population projections, birth rate projections, things of that nature. That usually means you're going to have to hire somebody that is in that business of doing those population projections. You may actually have to go out to bid in order to hire somebody to do that work. You're also going to have to do um, uh, an assessment of your academic programs. Are there changes that you have to do in order to upgrade your academic programs or that you want to do to acad upgrade your academic programs? Again, you may have to hire somebody to assist you in that process. There are planners who actually help look at your academic programs and trans that in, translate that into, an, uh, into a construction project. 
So you have to also take into consideration facilities needs. Uh, you are required by law to have a five-year uh, facilities plan, and it looks at your capital requirements with a five-year projection. So what you need to do is take and blend your population projection, your projection of academic needs, and your projection of five-year facilities needs and put those all together in a way that looks at your future needs. That could take you anywhere from six months to a year, depending on how fast you proceed and, and, and how comprehensive you want to be in terms of pulling it all together. It's very interesting that the academic slash capital planner may actually want to go through a process of validating your assumptions about your long-range academic objectives by engaging your public in that process. We in Skodik actually did that, and he held a couple um, large-scale meetings with the public to facilitate an understanding about the public's interest in the future academic programs of the, of the, the district. That took extra time, but it was well worth it because he, what he did is he confirmed the long-range perspective of the community for the academic programs of the district so that when we did a major capital project, then we did a $20 million project for a school district of, at that point, projected to be only 900 students. Um, that's a big capital project, but it was important that we had the community's um, long-term values and interest in mind when we did that kind of a capital project. But that took us quite a while. It was almost a year in the planning stages. Now you then move on to saying, okay, fine, now that we know where it is that we want to go in terms of our physical plan, our demographics, and our projection of our academic program, and we can translate that into what we want to do from a, a capital perspective, now we need an architect. So at that point, you got to go out to bid for an architect firm. So that means you've got to develop an RFP, you send it out, you get several different architectural firms to respond, you bring them in, you have to do uh, interviews, you may, have to wanna, you may want to take a look at what they've actually designed, do some field trips to find out exactly what those buildings look like that they've already designed, talk to the superintendents of, and, and board members about what's gone on in terms of how they liked the work that was done, what the relationships were, and, and that, that then allows you to make that choice. That could take you several months in being able to make that decision about who the architect's going to be. Once you've made that selection, then you have to go into concept design. And this becomes very important. It involves discussions with the board, discussions with the administrative team, discussions with faculty, and you're translating now the academic programmatic aspects of what you envision for the future into conceptual design based upon what it is you currently have and what it is that you want for the future. So the architect is now taking all of this and basically translating into concept and design work and pictures that what you hope to have as a future building. And they're bouncing that off the board and the board is saying, ah, I like this, I don't like that, this makes sense, that doesn't make sense. And then ultimately you're ending up with a concept design that, that has to then be sent to the state education department. And it's got to be detailed enough so that state ed can say, okay, this makes sense. And these costs that are associated with this design are allowable costs for state aid purposes. You have to have that because that will tell you what amount of the building is going to be aidable and what is not going to be aidable. Now, this is important because not everything that goes into a building is subject to state aid. There are certain kinds of costs that may not be subject to state aid, and you need to know that because when you go to the public with this proposal that they're going to end up voting on, you got to tell them how much of that project is going to be subject to state aid and, and, what, and, and how much that means that they're going to have to bear through local tax levy. So this is a very important discussion that takes place with state ed, and it's all at the concept design. Well, that whole process could take as much as nine months, and so that's a significant amount of time. Now, you then have to schedule it for public vote. And this is a strategic decision that most school boards make. When do I want to bring this to vote? And quite frankly, you're looking for a time where you think it is suitable in order to get a positive vote because what you want to do is you want to get the public to vote on this thing and to approve it. Uh, so you're always strategically looking for a time that makes sense. Um, you don't 
you don't want to discourage people from voting, but you want to encourage people to vote and to vote in a positive way. So you're strategically looking for that time that makes sense. Now, you also have to plan for public presentation around this. So you need to have enough time and enough meetings in enough places for the public to get a good sense of what you're proposing, what the impacts are, both programmatically and the impacts on the community, and how much it's going to cost and what the, the impacts are going to be on the taxpayers. So that has to be laid out and scheduled, p public meetings, presentations, and then the time for the vote. All that has to be put in place. Once that vote is done and you've got approval, now you go into detailed drawings. The other thing you're going to do, however, is before those drawings are done, you're most likely going to hire a construction management firm. This is a relatively new phenomenon. Um, and it used to be that you had a clerk of the works that was maybe your own employee or you hired somebody to be a construction manager from uh, a, a individual, uh, an individual who served as a construction manager or served as a clerk of, work, clerk of the works to represent you in the process of as, as the construction work take play, took place. But now what is much more commonplace is to hire a construction management firm. This is very important because what that construction management firm is doing is as the drawings are being developed, the construction management firm is actually working with the architects to make sure that, in fact, that the thing can be built as drawn. And these people are builders. They know that the, the building can be built as drawn. And if it can't be, they tell them, you can't do that. The way you've drawn it, it can't be built, or it can't be built as, as from a reasonable cost perspective. So they are literally uh, representing you and telling the, the architects what's reasonable from a cost perspective and what is reasonable in terms of its ability to be built in a, an efficient and, and cost-effective way. So they represent you um, in, as, as, as the owner in terms of assuring that the thing can be built and built right and built reasonably from a cost perspective. They also help with regard to cost control because they know how to build things and what the costs are and what the material costs are because that, that's their business. They build things. So uh, it's very important that you get the right construction management firm. And again, you're going to go out to bid. You'll get several responders, and then you got to select the right kind of firm. And so this is another part of the process, and, and it has to occur it, it can be occur simultaneously with the beginning of the drawings, but it has to be done in such a way that they can actually participate in the architect's drawing process. The other thing that happens is, is that once you've got the drawings, you then have to submit them to State Education Department for approval. Right now, I think they're running about nine months. Um, when Skodak went to submit them, we ex expected nine months, and it took a year and a half for the state ed to approve the, the, uh, the, 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 the drawings. The bottom line is that they're getting better, but they were severely understaffed, um, and it took a long time. They began to contract out some of the engineering work, and that helped improve things. Um, but the bottom line is you've got to allow for su some substantial amount of time for state ed to actually review your drawings and, and get them approved. Um, so that adds another dimension of time. You also probably want to look at the idea of a commissioning uh, uh, agent for you. Now, what, a, what does a commissioning contractor do? Commissioning means that when the building is built, they go in and make sure that all of the systems that are in place actually operate the way they're supposed to. So they're going to check out all your electrical systems. They're going to check out all of your heating, uh, air conditioning systems. They're going to check out every operational system to make sure it does what it's supposed to do. And this becomes very important because uh, I mean, we've had it happen. We had it in Skodak where the builders, the contractors, they left. And it turned out that a year later we found out that one particular operating system in one of our buildings, in one of the um, uh, offices, or it actually wasn't, it was a classroom that was set up and the, the lighting system that was supposed to be in there did not work. And then we had to go in and repair it. And it, and it was something that was up in the, the ceiling, way up in the ceiling. It was a, a two-story um, room that had not had a finished ceiling in it. And, and it was something that we couldn't even find initially what was wrong with it. And a commissioning agent actually goes in and, and checks out all these things beforehand. And, and before that contractor leaves, 
and 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 the bonds are released and it, that we make he makes sure that in fact everything's done it's well worth it to get somebody like that to check everything out oh, by the way there's another part of the process here and that is the design of all the uh, the details on interior work um, and you don't realize how difficult this is teachers and others get involved in doing things like what color is the paint what kind of carpet are we going to use? What is the floor finishing going to look like? What color are the are the, uh, the the lockers going to be? And it goes on and on and on and on and on. Where's the copier room going to be? How are we going to access it? Are there going to be, uh, what type of locks are we going to put on the doors? Ugh, it goes on and on. And that can be a long and laborious process. Bottom line is, um, I, 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 <laughs> The other thing you, you don't realize is that if it's a significant construction project and you got kids in the school and, and you want to provide for safety, you may actually have construction taking place only in the summers, and it could take two years for the work to be done because you can only construct in the summer months. Um, so the bottom line, when you add this all together, you could be looking at six and a half, seven years from beginning to end to get this thing done. And if your six-year term is over with, you began it, and you don't see it finished. So I, I just want you to understand the, the, the life cycle of a major, major construction problem, project, rather. It is not as quick as people think it, should, it, it, it ought to be. It is a very long-term thing. Um, I, I can tell you that when, when we first began in Skodak, looking at the need to replace our elementary school in the village of Castleton, from that beginning, it took 10 years until that project was completed. And that's from the beginning when we first started discussing it until it was finally completed and occupied. 10 years. So um, it, 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 it's, uh, it's not as simple as people think it is. In recent years, especially since the tax cap, it is increasingly essential that school districts seek ways to reduce costs and at the same time retain services, maintain facilities, and preserve and expand academic programs. One of the ways districts can do this is to seek out partnerships with other school districts and other municipal governments. There are several ways that partnerships and service sharing agreements can be handled. One example is as simple as sharing bus routes. For example, schools A and B transport students to a site at which students board school C's bus for travel to a final destination. Just like in typical carpool arrangements, the districts rotate so that the trip to the final destination shifts weekly from C to A to B. The same logistical arrangements can occur when A and B contract with C for the final leg of the trip through an intermunicipal agreement a form of contract between governments. Other types of services, such as sharing a buildings and ground supervisor, bus maintenance, etc., can likewise be contracted for among districts through intermunicipal agreements. One district gets revenue offsetting its cost of operations and the other districts get better service at lower cost, a win for both districts. Intermunicipal agreements can take place between local school districts and local governments for services such as maintenance of driveways and parking lots, as well as snow plowing. Collaborative arrangements for both services as well as academic programs which maintain or enrich opportunities for students may also be arranged through the BOCES, which also generates BOCES state aid. In recent years, there has been increased emphasis on utilization of BOCES to maximize sharing districts using BOCES. There are also growing possibilities for arrangements between schools and businesses. For example, many schools have made contractual arrangements with companies that installed solar collectors. These installations result in leasing arrangements between the parties that produce cost savings to the school district and revenue benefits to the companies. Similar beneficial arrangements exist for such things as pouring rights and naming rights. These are often considered business relationships. But they also incorporate partnership concepts. There has always been growth in areas such as internships and the sharing of business practices that result in academic programming and staff development support which improve academic opportunities for both students and faculty. This demonstrates that the relationship between schools and businesses do not have to be just about money. 
Districts increasingly are entering into consortium arrangements with other school districts for large-scale bidding and purchasing activities. Projects such as oil, natural gas, health insurance, workers' compensation insurance, and prescription drug insurance are commonly acquired through a consortium approach. Sometimes these are organized through the BOCES and sometimes through other relationships, including those directly with business partners. It is expected that many more types of sharing arrangements will evolve because of continued budget pressure on schools to become more cost efficient due to ongoing budget pressure, especially from the tax cap. School districts have been sharing services for years, predominantly through the BOCES. Uh, we ba basically um, been doing all kinds of things in terms of using the BOCES to uh, collaborate and to cooperate and to buy services from the BOCES in order to maximize our, um, our, uh, our revenues and also to minimize uh, our cost. If we needed to buy a, a physical therapist or an occupational therapist and we didn't have the resources to, to hire somebody full-time and we didn't have the need for somebody full-time, we would go to our BOCES and say, okay, we need a part-time PT or an OT. Does some other school district have the same need? And if the answer was yes, then the BOCES would go hire that, that person and then we'd share. And we've been doing that on a regular and ongoing basis. But there's also other provisions in the law, uh, New York State law, um, that provide for an intermunicipal agreement that allow um, governments to contract with each other in order to share services. This was something that most uh, governments did not uh, use in, uh, very often, especially school districts. Um, basically what the law provides is that if two governmental agencies can do the same thing they can enter into an intermunicipal agreement to allow one of them to basically buy that service from another government. And what that means is, is that, and I'll give you a concrete example, um, Skodek Central School District provides, through an intermunicipal agreement, management of the entire transportation uh, service for Rensselaer City School District. We supervise their bus drivers, we dispatch their buses, and we maintain their buses through a contract. And that contract is an intermunicipal agreement between Skodak and Rensselaer City, City School District. That's good for them. We substantially improve their uh, record with regard to maintenance of their buses. Um, they're very satisfied with how we handled supervision of their bus drivers and the dispatching of their buses. Um, it helps us because it defrays some of the costs that we have for our own transportation department. It keeps our mechanics busy. Um, it's been, it's been a, a, a satisfactory relationship between both districts. Um, so not only are we buying substantial services from our BOCES, but we also now have an intermunicipal agreement between ourselves and Rensselaer, and it's good for both us and them. We also do things through intermunicipal agreements that help on the academic side. We have an intermunicipal agreement that affects ourselves, Saratoga, and Averill Park, and Hudson Valley Community College. We put together a, um, a I guess you could call it a distance learning uh, program between the three uh, schools and Hudson Valley Community College. We have a genetics class that's being taught um, by one of our teachers and uh, it involves a classroom environment that is set in each of the three schools and is using the curriculum of Hudson Valley Community College and the laboratory equipment of Hudson Valley Community College. All of this is done through, again, an intermunicipal agreement and, um, and basically provides for a college-level genetics course being taught by one of our teachers who is an adjunct at Hudson Valley, so that it becomes a... Um, a dual credit bearing course, high school and college bearing, and it provides this genetic um, college level course to students simultaneously in the three schools. And that's another example of how you can do some um, sharing of services, and it results in a very significant improvement in, in academic programming for all three schools. And, uh, and it's interesting that uh, e example, one of the pieces of equipment is a $30,000 piece of equipment None of the three high schools could afford that piece of equipment, but we end up getting access to it through Hudson Valley Community College because they use it for their own programming. So it's, it's a great opportunity academically. 
I want you to think about some other things. Um, for example, snow plowing. Towns and villages have snow plows. You have parking lots and driveways. Um, how about contracting with the local town or village for handling snow plowing? That could be done through an intermunicipal agreement. Um, they do maintenance on large vehicles. Um, are there things that you have that maybe they could help out with? How about we do a lot of purchasing right now through um, the, the BOCES for things like energy and, um, and other types of services. Is there some way that we could expand that and, and use those uh, purchasing resources in a different kind of way? Um, I guess my point is, is that there are tremendous opportunities for intermunicipal sharing and, and the use of shared services that we haven't really thought about. And I think what it takes is a little bit of out-of-the-box thinking. We are very used to, as school districts, doing everything on our own. Um, we have lived in a very insular world. We encapsulate our world within the context of these are our resources and we're going to use it to do things by ourselves. And, and I think that we got to begin to start to look differently at things. Uh, and I think we're being forced to because of the tax cap. Our resources are now limited. And I think we've got to begin to think differently about how it is that we get things done. And if that means that we need to share um, and find ways to collaborate and cooperate with, with uh, each other and with other governments, um, we need to be able to do that in a way that makes sense. Um, we have opportunities to buy off of state contract and off of other government contracts. Um, are we taking advantage of that? When I say other government contracts, if the state of Georgia bids a contract um, and it is competitively bid, then we as school districts actually can go out and use that competitively bid contract to buy things off of it. Have we ever thought about doing that? It's permissible under state law. Uh, th these are kinds of things that, you know, part of the problem we have is that it's, it's extra work. Um, and, and we have cut back so substantially on our own staffing resources in, in, our, in our business offices that it, th doing these things is very difficult. But our BOCES have business office resources. Should we be asking our BOCES to help us with regard to these things? Um, you know, and if we did it and we were willing to do it across the board, we now, for example, buy energy and we buy um, ser energy services, got fuel, we buy um, natural gas from, and we do it in a collaborative, cooperative fashion. Should we be buying purchasing services using, inter using other states' per uh, uh, competitively bid contracts for other types of things? I, I don't know. But again, this is one of those things. We need to begin to start to think out of the box. So my, my point here is that I think there are, are different ways for us to do things, and we, not, we cannot have this perspective that says that everything we do has to be done by ourselves. We need to begin to start to think about sharing um, as a way for us to expand not just the way we operate, but also the way we arrange for academic opportunities for our students. This is a time for us to begin to change the way we think. Um, and it may be that collaboration um, needs to come to bear on our thinking in a way that we have not previously um, conceived of things. Um, this, is, this is a time for us to really think outside the box. We're being forced to do it. Now let's do it in a way that makes sense. And keep in mind that uh, we have an obligation to live within our means uh, and yet still um, provide adequate services, especially services for our kids. Um, and we can't do that unless we become as efficient and effective as we possibly can be. And it may be we need to take advantage of resources that, are, that come about through a, a shared arrangement with other municipalities. And uh, I think we, need, we owe it to. Uh, we owe it to ourselves, our taxpayers, and our kids to do that.